Um, so I'm here to talk about peatland restoration within Banabra Kanyog and give you a bit of background to the work and also particularly focusing on the heritage environment within peatlands and how we protect that heritage asset whilst carrying out peatland restoration. So I'll start off by just giving you a bit of background, which I'll move around a bit so I'm not making speakers buzz, um, a little bit of background on um, peatlands and why there is um, a real drive to try and carry out peatland restoration. Peatlands cover 3% of the world's surface, yet they hold 30% of the soil carbon. Uh, within Wales, we think that if degrading areas are returned to healthy function, that would cut 300,000 tonnes of CO2 per year being, being emitted, which is the equivalent of 5% of our Welsh transport emissions. So it's not an insignificant figure. And that's actually applying to what's actively eroding and degrading within our peatlands. And it doesn't touch on what we have as a peatland store. So what's our challenge and what are we trying to do? Well, obviously what we're trying to do is reduce carbon loss and we're trying to protect that carbon store that I've just touched upon. We're also, as, as a result of good peatland management, we'll be improving water quality, hydrological function, and we'll also be facilitating nature recovery by uh, returning those peatland habitats to their healthy form. And if we're doing things really well, we hope to encourage sequestration, so we'll actually start bringing um, see it, um, carbon out of the atmosphere and rather than releasing it into the atmosphere. Um, so just to give you a bit of a quick definition, um, a really nice one is that um, one that I found which says that areas where the majority of land has been subject to the accumulation of quaternary surface deposits, that's recent geological past, with a peaty texture under waterlogged conditions or areas currently supporting peat forming vegetation. So what does that mean within the park? Well, predominantly our peat bogs within the park are in upland areas and they tend to be the majority of which are blanket bog. So that tends to be a fairly consistent, relative sh relatively shallow peat. Um, and it tends to be in most circumstances relatively younger and may have anthropogenic influences. Within that landscape though, you can also find um, deeper peat, which tends to be post-glacial and can be, um, for example, attributed to, to post-glacial lake infilling. Um, and those tend to be older peat deposits. So where are we as far as understanding our peatland? At this stage, we think that we've got an estimated 16,000 hectares of peatland within the park. And within that 16,000 hectares, we estimate 40 to 60% is in poor condition in some way, either dry modified draining, actively eroding, and adversely affected by industrial fallout. So, and also what we don't really take into account, because most of our um, surveys in relation to peat extent tend to focus on peat that's over 50 centimetres in depth. So a lot of our shallower peatlands are not considered within that, within that extent. If you're really interested in kind of picking up on where peat extent is, um, there's a really good layer on the British Geological Society's website. If you go on there, they've got an interactive mapping and you can click on superficial layers and you'll be able to pick up the peatland extent on, the, on that layer. It's a good start point. So when we're talking about the peatlands in relation to um, archaeology and how, it, how well it can preserve archaeology, as many of you know, I'm sure, the way that peatlands function with their, in their waterlogged state lend themselves to preservation. And um, the waterlogged acidic anaerobic conditions characterise peatlands are ideal environments for long-term preservation of organic and some inorganic materials. An archaeologist working in dry land conditions may be fortunate to find 10% of what was there, whereas an archaeologist working in peatlands may find 90% of the material culture of ancient communities. And I've put a table in here, a figure in here, sorry, which really, I don't know if, how well you can read it, but essentially what it's showing you is um, how well, particularly organic materials like skin, um, plants, wood, um, up here I think it's got invertebrate and textiles, will be preserved as a percentage of preservation against what you can anticipate being preserved in a dry land um, sort of burial site. And I've got a couple of examples on the right hand side. These are both from Irish uh, peat digs relating to um, prehistoric trackway and a wooden vessel. So they're very significant 
um, means of um, historic environment, preserving historic environment. It's also important to think about um, the aspect of how they preserve things in relation to their formation. So what you get with peatlands is a real steady accumulation of peat, which leads to sequences with chronological integrity. A vertical section through an undisturbed peatland therefore effectively represents a slice back through time. For this reason, peatlands are also valued for the information they hold on past changes in climate, environment and vegetation, which can be revealed through the study of pollen, plant, insect remains and other proxies. Nice little sort of cross section picture here showing what, what that is describing. And I also put in here this is a, a piece I took out from a paper which looked at pollen analysis um, on Koi Taf. It's quite an old paper, but it's a really nice example of um, how they run pollen analysis. It's just north of Daranant, Koi Taf. Um, and basically, it's recording pollen um, abundance for different species throughout time. So it gives you a really interesting chronological sort of look at how different plants have colonized and then been sort of um, other plants have come in and colonized after. And there's a really interesting spike in relation to scrub encroachment onto within that within that peatland record. And it also tells us a lot and it provides a really useful comparator with other tools that we look at in relation to trying to understand climate changes through history and how we can co correlate that information. And for us as well, in modern times, it's really useful to help us understand what's happening on our, on our moorlands today with relation to things like um, increases in millennia dominance and whether we can attribute that purely just to different grazing pressure or whether climatic change is having an influence on those kind of changes. So I'll move on a little bit. So, Going back to what I'm doing, really what I want to do is just give you a very brief sort of overview of how, I, how we plan and implement peatland restoration work. And what I've got here is a slide really, which is really sort of, sort of demonstrates my start point. Um, so the background that you can see here is, is an aerial image and then overlaid onto the aerial image, these are um, ADAS polygons, which is a remote date survey that was done to try and define and record and identify areas where we've got deep peat, but also within those areas we know we've got, it's been identified as having degrading um, areas with erosion, areas with concern about peat function. And this is my start point. Um, I've, I've got 16,000 hectares of peatland, but it's scattered across, you know, all of the uplands from east to west of the park. So trying to narrow down where I'm looking for problems. This is a start point for me. So I'll remote survey these kind of layers for, to gain information. I'll make notes on what I can see from that. And then I'll go out and carry out site surveys. And these are all um, pictures that link to these different, very romantic, I'm glad um, Forrest is gone, he wouldn't be impressed. My romantically named polygon numbers for each of these areas. So what we're looking at here is different kinds of bare area erosion, water channel erosion, um, peat hagging and um, greater bare area erosion and lam lamination erosion here within these bare areas. So I'll quantify um, what we've got as far as these problems in, in, in area and I'll start to put up um, costs, um, I'll put up um, what my specifications are going to be for the restoration works within each of these given areas. So I'll come up with quantities for those areas for, of what interventions are going to be needed, be it materials, be it um, labor and be it, and techniques. And that's my start point really. And I'm going to run through very... <laughs> I thought that would be me earlier, but I got away with it. Um, so that's my start point and it's quite, Really where we are from here is also just briefly touching on, I'll touch on different techniques and then I'll talk a little bit how Alice and I work in relation to the historic environment. So again, this is remote survey um, data. This is drone survey information. This is a top right is a high resolution um, photography of Weinbach. So as you might re recall, this is the trig point on Weinbach. And we've been doing work here for about eight years in various stages of peat restoration. And these color um, polygons are different types of peatland restoration interventions that we've done already. But what this allows me to do is very accurately map and quantify different um, interventions, be it peat hagging, 
by linear meter, bare area treatment quantities, so I could start to really tie down exactly how much I need of everything in order to carry out the work. This lower map, I'm not sure how well it's come out, I can't see it that well from here, but it's actually giving you um, 50 centimeter contour interval detail, and it's giving you all of the water courses mapped on the same area. So that starts to give me um, the background information I need in order to plot and, and actually place exactly where interventions like dams can be put in so I get the right fall rates on the dams that are going to go in. It gives us a whole host of useful information that I can then build the picture of what I need to do. So different techniques, I'll run through these really quickly. Hag reprofiling, um, this is a, a gully, again, running off the same area that we looked at in the previous slides. This is actually a very steep slope profile. This is my colleague Richard, who's about six foot 10, probably maybe even a bit taller. Me. He's a tall chap, and he stood, and you can see how high these, these gullies are, these, these hags are either side of him. So effectively, when you get gullying, it's taking water away from the peatland down through into the catchment, and these adjacent areas, I'll use the laser instead of my finger, um, the peat adjacent to that, the water table in the adjacent peatland is dropping out into the gully, and that area of intact peat is effectively drying and starting to erode, and if it's not checked, that will just work its way back and back and back and back. So this, this whole area will start to erode back, and these gullies just get wider and wider. So water management and control, be it through dams and slowing permeable or impermeable dams start to raise the water table back up and start to re-wet the adjacent peat. Go through this as quick as I can. So that's a lovely example of before and after. This was last year on Wine When. And so you can see on the left hand side, this is what it looks like before work starts. Um, so the soil, it, uh, the vegetation is carefully peeled back, put to one side. The profile is then regraded to a shallower slope profile, and then the turves are put back and sort of interlocked into place to allow revegetation and stop that erosion process. Uh, this is these are different kinds of interventions to try and slow water movement. So on the top right here, we've been we've brought gabion stone in, and we've built gabion stone dams to create a permeable dam to allow pooling and raise that water table. These are timber dams. This is um, in the upper reaches of um, Wine Wen um, on Vayner Common to slow water movement and raise water levels. And then this is um, a test um, pilot we did with um, contour bunding to re-wet um, dry modified peat on, on um, a, an area of moorland on Wine Wen. And the surface water is actually is important, but also what's happening underneath. So we, we invert the, the peat and create a bund and create bunded cells, which then re-wet the peat behind those bunded cells. And actually, this was during one of the, you know, last year was a very dry summer. And towards the end of that summer, this is one of the last places on that mountain that still had water. All the main water courses were completely dry. And then finally, we're looking at bare area treatment. So this involves quantifying bare areas, flying, um, geotextiles, um, cut and bagged heather brush out onto site, and then using um, working with volunteers, wardens, contractors, to lay this textile onto, onto these bare areas. So it's a combination of rolling out this geotextile, which is these materials, this material here, which then becomes this, we're pegging it down, applying heather brush, spreading heather brush manually onto or underneath this material, and then seeding with locally harvested heather and grass seed to try and encourage re-establishment. Most of these pictures are from Pentrumai, which is about four and a half hectares of bare peat area, um, which suffered from a fire in the late 80s. And um, we've treated just over three, he three and a bit hectares, and we've got 1.3 hectares to do this year. Um, so it gives you a bit of background. So going into the historic environment, talking about how we start to preserve the historic environment within this, with this work. This is a really nice example of, of what, we're, what we're doing on the, in this, um, this slide here. Actually, I'll come back to this one. I've got a better picture of that further on. Um, so once I've done all the quantifying of, of my work and I understand what we're going to apply to each site, I start initiating conversations with Alice. We have a two-way conversation. I start giving a bit an overview of what we'd, we'd like to try and do in relation to peatland restoration. Alice then builds a picture of what that, how that fits in relation to the historic landscape. 
and we start to put together a con contract brief which will then form the basis for us bringing in an external archaeologist who will then supervise the project as from a historic environment perspective from that point on to delivery and one of their first tasks is to create is to put together a historic environment assessment and i'll talk to you a little bit about that now so I, i'm not going to read all this out and i'm sure we're probably starting to run a bit short on time because i'm my massively too long but um essentially what it does for me is and it's the first points really i don't know how well you can read this a keen eyes what it there's two there's two sections to this that are really relevant from my perspective the first part is the information gathering knowledge gathering basically that per, that person will be um pulling together through um desk study um uh, all of the pre-recorded information we have in relation to the sites that we want to work on, proximity of res re recorded artifacts, likelihood of there being artifacts in, in amongst the, the, the areas that we want to study. And we'll actually be putting together a detailed um, inf um, uh, document that will, inf will provide that information and guidance as to what's there, what, what we're going to be seeking to avoid and what we can are we going to have to work together to ensure that we minimize and we don't cause any damage to historic um, artifacts so that's the second part of what's really useful for me this is this kind of net, these lower points in here that relate to how to basically carry out the restoration process without damaging the historic environment that we have in that area and what it really does which is kind of what really sort of works for me and, and i'll, I'll talk very briefly about these is it narrows everything down from a very wide sort of sort of uh, uh, vision of what we're trying to look at into very detailed very specific targeted um, elements in relation to interventions and risk and that comes back to what I feed in so my my specifications for all the works are very detailed and they basically provide that background information that the archaeologists can act on and then give guidance as to how we carry out operations in a way that don't cause any problems and as far as guidance is concerned it's very it can be very clearly dis sort of distilled into these different elements as far as where the historic artifacts may be and that may be sub peat archaeology maybe archaeological remains contained within the matrix itself that means within the peat archaeological or archaeological remains located on the surface of the peat and the paleo environmental goes back to what we were talking about about that chronological timeline and what information is stored in relation to that and this is the slide i was talking about um, this is a really nice example again we're on pentrumai you may see these shadows here these are little rivulets of water erosion this is looking down the slope now looking north towards talgarth and these rivulets of minor sort of sm small rivulets of, of erosion are essentially effectively taking the peak down the slope and into the watercourses below and one of the things we were looking at in relation to the prescription for this site was whether we could use these remains of these sort of individual tussocks where they were available and convenient and effectively cut them off at, bait at ground level and place some intervals along these river channels uh, these little rivulets and what was clear from the hea was that actually as far as what we would be anticipating finding as far as historic remains are concerned be it flint scatters mesolithic um artifacts they would be they've they've been recorded predominantly on that surface of the mineral soil before peat formation in that, that area has, has has really started so then gave a specific guidance in relation to these kind of interventions that said yes you can potentially cut these tussocks off and place them in here and you're not going to risk damaging that historic environment but there's a caveat to that in that the contractors and the wardens and those involved were involved in a toolbox talk with the archaeologists to talk about how and if there was anything found what what you would likely to find if there was anything and how to make sure that that find is is re recorded and, and reported to ensure that that um, that information is um, is passed on in the right way and that um, any, any the, that uh, artifact is preserved. And this is this is a stark contrast as far as when uh, these this kind of toolbox talk can happen in relation. This is Peter Dorling giving a toolbox talk to our contractors. This is the same site, um, February, and um, you know a, a very cold day, but, but you know it was a day that everybody was available. So that, so there was a toolbox talk given, disseminating that information and sharing that information to uh, to all of the people who are involved in this restoration work. 
More also, just as important, we'll have obviously where we think there's going to be a, high, a, a higher risk of potential disturbance to historic remains, then there will be targeted watching briefs outlined as a requirement from that historic environment document. And this is Peter carrying out a watching brief for specific works. This is the, the very start of that, um, the creation of those contour bands, and um, Peter basically being there to see how the material is being excavated and watching the material as it comes out with the excavator and talking through the operation with the contractors to ensure that they're aware of what potentially they may, be, may come across and sharing and, and ensuring that everybody's up to speed with, with what's, what's happening. And really, the main aspect as well is feedback as well. So what we'll, what we'll do when we come to the end of the peatland restoration works is we'll feed back and have a, a, a follow-up sort of feedback in to discuss where there may be shortcomings and where we need to change these operations. Part of that feedback also relates to surveying and monitoring. So we're also talking about how we can understand what we've got and improve our understanding and knowledge of what we've got. And this comes down to... Um, a lot of this comes down to our volunteers, and I can't, cannot emphasize how much they contribute and how valuable they are to our work. These are our conservation volunteers. This is Andy's completed his drone training, so now can do follow-up drone survey work on areas where we're, we're carrying out restoration and other areas we might be interested in to help with that preparation and, and feedback on what the work we've done. This is our rapid peatland survey team carrying out actual ground truthing of the remote survey data that we looked at to really get an understanding of what we've got in relation to depth, extent and condition of our peatlands, really important. This, if you're interested, is what we're, fe we're all feeding into. So this is the Welsh peatlands data on a portal, which is um, Natural Resources Wales. If you put in NPAP, um, National Peatland Action Programme, you can dial into this and you can get a lot of information on peatland extent, carbon store, works completed so far nationally, and we are part of a national peatland that part, part of that National Peatland Action Programme. And finally, I needed to make sure I get this far because Alice will kill me if I don't. Um, I'm talking, I wanted to talk about one of our sites that we've got to, um, outlined for restoration work this winter, which is Wine Viglin Velen. Um, it's a site we've been carrying work out on since 2006. Um, it's a very important Mesolithic site. It's had, um, so, so we've had rec records of Mesolithic and um, artifact scatters right through the Mesolithic period um, on this site. It's essentially a post-glacial lake infill, and so it would have been a really important focal point for people moving and settling um, as a resource for fishing, for waterfowl, and also potentially for clear, there's evidence of clearances around that site to encourage large game for game hunting. So a really important, very, very significant site within the park as far as its historic environment is concerned. And here's the important bit. What we're doing in relation to peatland restoration, we talked about carbon store and we talked about peat function, but what we're also doing at the same time, if we get it right and we carry out effective peatland restoration and we get good function and we get the, the, the system working properly, we're also preserving that historic environment within that within that um, carbon, that peatland store. So we get it we get it right, we're actually preserving this environment rather than potentially causing any damage to it. Um, so very quickly, a couple of little figures there. Our average 2.5 to 3 metres depth, you know, um, half a million um, cubic metres of peat, 250,000 tonnes of carbon stored just within that one site. That's me. <laughs>